presented. Uh, before we uh, do more formal introductions, uh, my name is Peter Schilke and uh, Martha Kershaw is here joining me. Uh, we are um, from Damon College. And again, we'll do more formal intros uh, as we dive in here. But uh, first and foremost, we'd love to uh, get some of your input before we start our session. We're going to be talking about uh, engagement strategies to increase teacher presence in online courses. And if you can, uh, please uh, navigate to menti.com. And I'm going to go ahead and bring the prompt up on the screen here in a minute. Uh, but the code is both on the presentation. It will also be on the slide. But if you can go ahead and uh, answer our question here, if uh, those who have more experience in teaching online may uh, be able to identify some more common myths. What are some common myths when it comes to teaching online courses? So things that we're, we're told before it starts or things that we hear around the water cooler that may or may not be true or may, um, may or may not be completely true, I should say. But if you can uh, enter in some of those comments, we'll leave just a couple of minutes here to see uh, what we get in. And uh, We'll, uh, we'll discuss those uh, th both throughout the presentation and address them uh, immediately. So, that's a great one. You guys are picking great myths for us to talk about. So we probably could talk about a couple of these, right, Peter? I think a lot of these are speaking points that uh, throughout our, our presentation. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, you know, session forum thing is interesting. Uh, schools of thought on, on this one. Um, I'm not sure that we're gonna talk about that today, but you know, definitely it's a, place for so faculty should be in some classes not to be excuse me um, because the student interaction is more meaningful than if I adopt it with adding something but there's other times where I'm actively involved in it. and I think in the, the, the faculty should be in it um, and should be and is you know maintaining in a good direction. Are there any myths, Martha, that you wanna dive into now before we head into the, to the more formal presentation? I don't think so. I think we're gonna address a lot of these in the, in the formal presentation. Great. Let me visit this at the end as well. Whoops. So as P Peter said, we're gonna do more formal introductions. Um, I'm Martha Kershaw. I am an assistant professor of nursing at uh, Damon College. We have online RNTS uh, format. Um, and we have a beautiful picture of our campus and Peter and I decided to show you a couple of the buildings in our backgrounds. today back and it's interesting because when we were listening to the keynote speaker earlier we're going to use a lot of similar terms to what she did we're going to use them in a little bit different context uh, but definitely we're going to use some similar terms
Sorry, Martha, you're freezing up a little bit on me. Oh, I'm audio. so sorry. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I apologize. I know my internet likes to freeze at two o'clock in the afternoon for some reason. <laughs> anyway, with the objectives, we're going to focus on um, communication and responsiveness and feedback. And um, one of the things I noted when we were listening to the keynote speaker at the beginning of this day um, is that we're going to use a lot of similar terms to what she used, but we're going to use them in a little bit different context. So the theme throughout our, our, our discussion really today is that um, the, the whole purpose is, and, and a lot of our myths were, were kind of centered around that, is in building an online community. That uh, some of the myths that came in is that um, students are unable to interact with one another. Students are shortchanged in their education um, and miss out on one-on-one -on -one student and faculty interaction. So. Um, a big theme again is that building an online community, how do we do that? And we're gonna be talking about different strategies and, and different ways that we have implemented those or that we recommend to implement those. And they're not always tech-based. We wanna be clear on that. While some of them like, for example, um, you know, Mentimeter is, is a way to further engage students and, and uh, solicit some more feedback and information, it's not always going to be tech-based. Sometimes it's generic tech-based, uh, a term that we use heightened text-based, meaning how can we uh, elevate, even if it is a text-based communication, a text-based course or information, how can we elevate it in some way? And then of course, multimodal, how can we engage our students in a multimodal format, uh, text, images, uh, audio, video, uh, and, um, you know, include all of their sensory, uh, their senses and learning. So again, you know, one of the things we want to do is lay the groundwork for engagement. And we do that by setting expectations with the students, providing them with information about um, when we might be available, what they can expect of us, what we want, what we expect of them. Um, and, you know, again, I, I think we, if I can refer back to the keynote, you know, it's all about communication and providing information to the students so that they have an idea of what is going to happen in course and how they can interact with you. And we've left that setting expectations mildly ambiguous for intentionally, but what we'd like for you everyone to do is if you can place in chat, if you can select your be the best answer, what faculty information is most important, and I guess it should say most important to our learner or to our students, but if you can place A, B, C, or D in the chat as to what you think is most important. I see a lot of D's. David says yes. <laughs> <laughs> and David, that's what we were getting at. A lot of it, basically all of these are important. Um, all of them could be correct. It's really about communication. And like we said earlier, um, setting expectations. You know, you do that in multiple different ways. Um, you can provide emails, you can have written instructions, you can have recorded messages, you can have texts, um, and other items that you think would be useful uh, to the students to understand uh, so we um, supported. And David, you didn't misbehave, you, you had the perfect answer. Yes, the, the, the purpose of the question is to talk about what is the what is the important information and it's all of it uh, and the reason why we leave manage expectations somewhat ambiguous is because the faculty availability the contact information the response time that's all specific and unique to you as the instructor to to the institutions 
guide or to the institution's expectations, perhaps to a department's or a program's requirements. Uh, so when we say, you know, manage those expectations, if there are institutional expectations, in some ways that can be beneficial because students are more aware of those and they hear those repeated. If there are not institutional expectations, it's up to us as faculty to set them. Uh, and, um, you know, our availability may not be as transparent um, to our online faculty, at, or I'm sorry, to our online students as it is to our face-to-face -face students or our on-prem students. So it's just, it, again, this list is, is not an all-inclusive list of things that we should, the expectations we need to manage, but it's some of the, the highlighted ones. Tools to ensure success, uh, going along with um, managing those expectations and, and communicating those expectations, but our very strong explanations. <laughs> Accessing resources, where are students showing intro videos or giving um, you know, text-based step-by-step directions? Where should students be going to access certain resources? Where can they find the instructions for the assignments? Are there, um, you know, are there duplicates? And this comes up sometimes um, if we're, we've uploaded a document into two different sections of a course or we've, we've emailed it as well as uploaded it to our LMS. Are those two the same document? Because courses change semester over semester, but sometimes language doesn't get nudged the way that it should. Um, one very big one is that that fourth item is using uniform language is if something is called something on the syllabus, is it titled the same thing in the LMS in the grade book does it carry the same name, because that can be a very confusing point for students that can cause a lot of anxiety they're working on an assignment they're throwing themselves into a particular um, assessment. And they're not sure where it falls in terms of the grading expectations or, or what rubric to apply because that uniform language is, is the rubric that's provided in the syllabus called the same thing that it's posted in the LMS as. And it's little things like that that can cause students a great deal of anxiety, but can go a long way in um, additionally supporting our students in online courses. And of course, in, in all things, accessibility for technology, not only accessibility for technology, but accessibility of all of our course content, uh, whether it be our, um, whether it be our presentations and our slide decks or our documents, are we using uh, semantic headings in Word or Google Docs? Are we using proper uh, contrast as you, I mean, you see our slides, this is black text on a white background, that's not accidental, it's, it's, uh, ensuring the appropriate contrast for, um, you know, an accessible audience. And then again, as I alluded to earlier, a step-by-step -step written guide or a video, an intro video to a course. Here's where you should be accessing weekly. Here's where you can access the discussion board. And again, it does not have to be a video. It does not have to be high-tech, multimodal. Uh, it could be screenshots. It could be, again, a uh, a bulleted list, click here, click there, click there next, and you'll get to where you need to go. But those step-by-step, -step, whether it's written or multimodal guides, go a long way, again, of welcoming students to the course and um, making them feel comfortable and, and reducing that anxiety. I'd even take that a step further as uh, in a face-to-face -face course as well, students' first interactions with the course is almost always on the LMS, not face-to-face -face with, their, with their instructor. So having those step-by-step -step written guides and videos is beneficial in all courses, but especially in online courses. So with um, feedback, we wanted uh, guys to tell us in chat what timely meant to you. When you hear that term, what does it, you know, is it an hour? Is it a week? Is it, um, does it depend assignment to assignment? We've got less than 24 hours, preferably within 20, within 12 hours. 
24 to 48 hours. It's whatever you stated in the syllabus. That's a great answer. And whatever you establish depends on the stated rules. Yep. Perfect. You guys have great answers. Um, and, and really, it's whatever you communicate. You, you set the stage, you set the expectation, as we mentioned before. You manage the expectation um, by behaving in the way that you said you were going to. Um, and you um, really do make connections through feedback with students. Um, you know, if you think about um, when you provide feedback to a student, you really wanna encourage them and you really want them to maybe change their behavior for the next time that they do something. So it's important to lead with the positive um, to possibly change any um, negative feedback to areas for improvement. Sometimes if something that um, I really want students to change the next time they really miss the boat on something, I'll do an extra communication email to provide them with what we missed and how they can change it a little bit more in detail than I maybe have room for in our LMS. Um, and in terms of, so we talked about responsiveness and consistency, and you guys kind of um, alluded to the different times. Again, we set the expectations, we follow through. And if for some reason we have to communicate to the students you know, if we can't meet our expectations, then we have to communicate to the students that there's a change. This week in particular, for some reason, I had a ton of grading to do and I had given deadlines that I couldn't meet. And so I, I took the time to email the students and just tell them, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't make it by them, but I'm going to have it done um, here. And like in particular, one of my 400 level courses, um, students lead a seminar every week and I try to grade that on the day that the seminar ends, but unfortunately I was still backed up. And so that was individual emails to the people who had, had led um, those seminars. And they, you know, they were thankful for the, for the information. Um, you, the other thing about responsiveness and consistency, you know, it's responsiveness to not just grading, but emails. If a student, um, if a student emails you and, you know, you say that you're going to respond within 24 hours, then you want to respond within 24 hours. If you say that you're going to take a day off and you're not going to be responding to emails that day, you really do want to make sure that you take that time that you gave yourself. It's difficult if you respond at a time when you said you weren't going to because students sometimes will think that you'll do that every single time. So currently today, you know, my students have been told that um, I'm not available today but I also had my second vaccine shot this morning. So I told them that I was gonna not be available tomorrow as well, because I'm not sure how I'm gonna to respond to the vaccine. So it's, you know, that sort of communicating and setting the stage um, and then following through. But responsiveness is really part of engagement. You know, the, the thing that I find with my students, I give them as much information as possible and then I do follow through on them because that's how I engage them. And uh, just Joel in chat, you uh, put a great comment, emails within 24 hours for assignments, it depends. And that is, the, that is the key word, it depends, because what type of assignment is, what type of assessment it is, and it, and it circles back to setting the expectations at the beginning. It also comes into responsiveness. If something is said that it's going to be graded by a certain date, and if it's not, that can be communicated. And even if it's, you know, these were supposed to be posted by Friday, life came up, they'll be posted by, you know, Saturday at five or, you know, reset that reestablish that expectation. Because if, if any, if anyone in here was a student like I was, if, uh, you know, grades are said that they're going to be posted Saturday at five, I'm on at 505 hitting refresh until those things populate. Um, again, I don't know if that says more about me, um, but there are certainly students out there as well. Um, so if, if, delays do happen to, you know, communicate those delays, it will at least ease the anxiety so the students don't think that they're missing something um, because their grades aren't posted or their feedback hasn't been received yet.
talking about so, regular and oh go ahead martha no you go ahead i was uh in addition to responsiveness to those just in time emails or uh getting returning assignments and providing meaningful feedback uh you do also we encourage our faculty to have regular interaction with the students, whether it's a weekly update, to give a kind of universal or umbrella feedback. Uh, you know, uh, we've received the the midterms. You know, uh, hope everybody's having a good week. You know, regular interactions that students can count on. Uh, most LMSs, uh, actually, um, all LMSs. I'll say this with with relative confidence, having not been in all of them, but all LMSs allow you to delay messages and posts and, and announcements and things like that. So you can uh, put together communications and have them timed and sent. Uh, if, you, if you interact with your students every week on Monday at 8 a.m., you can delay those and and those regular interactions, they're kind of, they're, they're, they're warm and fuzzy because students can rely on them and they know that they're gonna be there. Uh, and, and again, if you're a student like I was or like some of the students that you know you have in your own courses, they're gonna be, if, if they're not there at 8.30 because they're, you know, they expected them there at eight, you know, you might be receiving those emails or, or um, you know, they're hitting refresh and things like that. So um, it, again, with, if you're going to have those regular interactions, um, you know, do keep them consistent if as best you can as students begin to rely on them. And again, and you see the, the note on the screen, remind them that you are there, that you're not only there, you're a physical person as well as a name on a screen, but you're also there for them. It's, you know, to encourage constant encouragement to reach out, whether it's open office hours, whether it's email, if you do a, a questions for the instructor discussion forum, however you encourage your students to reach out, that constant reinforcement of, hey, I'm there if you need me, um, you know, again, that goes a long way. I tend to do about three um, scheduled weekly contacts, a week opening um, a check-in midway through the week and then a reminder at the end of the week. Um, it's, I've talked to my students about what's too much and what's enough and the three seems to be a good mix of, of what works for the students. Um, and every single one of them ends with how they can get hold of me, that I'm here for them, that I encourage them to ask me any questions that they have. Um, and, and I do think that's important. And I see the dialogue going on in chat. I'm loving what I see already because it's kind of getting to where, <laughs> getting to where we're going a little bit here too. Um, talking about LMS is sending out grade specific messages from the grade book. Uh, so you can set certain thresholds to automatically alert students or alert you as the instructor as to you know what's going on in your class, whether it's a certain grade level. I know in Blackboard, we use Blackboard Learn at Damon. Uh, you can set it if a student hasn't accessed the course in X number of days and you can control what number that is. Uh, the student will be alerted and you will also be alerted that, hey, you haven't accessed this course in X number of days. So it allows you as the instructor to reach out and you know kind of see what's going on. Uh, uh, Darla and uh, Stacy talking about Remind and Pronto, uh, other ways to interact with students. And like I said, we're getting ahead of ourselves just a little bit because we, <laughs> we, we are almost there to some of those other, um, those external services as, as well as some of our favorite ed tech tools uh, to further engage our students as well. Again, talking about whether it's a weekly check-in, have a regular schedule, put a personal touch on it. Uh, I, Bitmojis are very popular in education. I myself, I use mine even in Zoom here. Uh, I, I put myself popping out of a computer to let my students know that I am both a physical person as well as a digital presence in their life. But it's something that um, can help the messages. It can, uh, you can give a bit of your personality, whether it be in your emails or whether it be in your LMS posts and things like that, to give a little bit of your personality along with it. Again, prevent those disconnections, those long periods of, of time that go by where you're not interacting Excuse me, with I've students. added things to engage the students a little bit. 
I've added a few things to engage the students a little bit so that I can get to know more about them. Uh, I think I'm unstable again. Um, they, uh, at the bottom here, we have cause for celebration. You know, I have students who are um, moving from an associate degree program to a bachelor's degree program. And so they may be getting jobs, they may be taking their licensing exam. I just recently had a student who passed a really tough certification exam. And so I added a cause for celebration into um, the weekly check-in so that I can share some of that information. Can, you know, they can be celebrated themselves. You know, David just put in, it's important to help students know faculty are human. I also have, am enjoying in my um, high flex classes that I get to see the students or even just, you know, a, an asynchronous or a synchronous class, excuse me, I get to see the students in their own environment, which I think is really useful to, to make us all a little bit more human. Um, I really love, and I probably wouldn't have loved this pre-COVID, but I really love um, that one of my colleagues' cats is in every one of our meetings or like my nursing education class this week, every single person had a dog showing, you know, um, coming in and out of the class or when their children come in. I mean, we're all living our lives in a completely different way. And so, you know, allowing some flexibility when you're teaching is, is really humanizing. I like to see them in their own environment. Um, the other thing that I do is tie in current events. So, um, Recently, my students had done a seminar on advanced practice nursing, and there was a huge change made in Wisconsin with an advanced practice nursing role. So I was able to, um, to, to share that information and tie it back to that seminar that we had done. So it was, um, you know, they appreciate that sort of making things. We've done a lot of changes in our nursing classes actually to tie in the pandemic, not to constantly talk about, you know, all the things that were hit with on social media and in the news, but to tie in, um, let them talk about, you know, frame their discussions around what they're experiencing in the workplace and uh, tying that into the topics that we're talking about in class. Christine mentioned she does a, a check-in and her students thanked her at the end of the semester. And uh, something that I do in my teaching, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or it's um, online, in a 15-week semester in weeks three, six, and nine, I give the exact same survey, the exact same touching point. It's a Google form. It's three questions. It's basically a start, stop, continue. What do you, what do you like about the course? Uh, what's, have you found most challenging about the course? Um, and you know, what, um, what would you like the course, um, to do, or what did you expect the course to do that it's not? And I give the exact same form. So it's not a whole lot of, um, additional, uh, I guess, administrative work on my part as the instructor, but I give the exact same form three times throughout the semester to solicit some of that feedback. And, uh, you know, some of the feedback I get can really inform uh, the way the rest of the semester goes by, you know, changing the, the whether it's the uh, delivery method or the communication method or something like that. But it gives me, because I use the term, not all semesters are created equal. Not all of our rosters are created equal as well. So some feedback I may get from one section of the course may be um, dramatically different from a different section of the course. Um, sometimes the feedback can't inform those changes. That's Those are the practices. That's how, the, those are the expectations. And that's how we're going to continue to to conduct the course. Uh, but soliciting that information and communicating with the students, you know, what can we change and what uh, is kind of not going to change uh, can go a long way as well. So um, we do follow up quite a bit with our students. Uh, if they're falling behind, I'm sure everyone does. Um, we, I include targeted reminders, but when I follow up with a student who's fallen behind, I don't follow up, hey, you're behind in my class, what's going on, I follow up with, hey, I haven't seen you for a while. Are you okay? Um, is there anything I can help? 
try to be as flexible as I can um, where I can. You know, again, right now uh, during the pandemic, most of my students are working nurses. So, and they have families and, you know, again, they're living adults that have a lot of responsibility. So I try to be as flexible as I can. Um, the, if I accept late does affect me, but can be flexible for the students so that they like, I can do it right, but I can do it in a little while. Um, that I think that's helpful to them to know. Um, that's a great thing in the chat, Elizabeth put, um, missing you in the virtual classroom. That's a great thing. I, you know, mine is, you know, checking, again, I use that check-in term because I'm checking in to make sure that they're okay. Um, but again, meeting with, with, hey, I'm not sure if Martha's audio is dropping out for everyone. Um, but again, the the leading with, hey, we're here for you, looking out for the student, not focusing on missed work or missed attendance or anything like that. It's it's being there for the student. And um, you know, I'll circle back and I'll reiterate to the or circle back to the conversation that was had in chat earlier. Some of our LMSs can do this for us in alerting us. Uh, and a follow-up from us from an LMS, uh, you know, has has a nice personal touch to it. There are other um, platforms or other tools like Remind, like Pronto, uh, and that leads us into our next mentee here. If you can return, if you you might still be in mentee, and if you are, uh, if you are, uh, I advanced the slide, so you should be able to enter in a new. Um, a new entry. If you have not, please do return to www.menti.com and you can put in the code on the screen. Again, it looks like uh, our moderators put in the Menti link and we can drop that code. But you can put in that code. And what we're asking now is what is your favorite ed tech platform to use to engage your students? Now, while you're dropping those in there, uh, Martha and I will kind of just uh, talk over top here. But uh, when we're choosing technology and being multimodal, it should be very purposeful. Uh, we, we put on here purposeful and selective. It should be meeting some type of an instructional or interactive goal that we have set already. We don't want to flood students with too many technology. If it's something that is a campus wide, something that's supported by your campus's help desk or IT department, that's always a great platform to use because they have support there. Um, I'll be selective. And one bullet point that I probably left off here is though, use it early. And when you do introduce it, use it often. Uh, I say use it early because the, the student's first interaction with technology in a course should be low stakes, no stakes. Um, if they're going to feel anxiety over the technology, it shouldn't be over the fact that there's a due date that day. So it should be in week one, um, week two. And again, that's where using those institutionally supported tools, if they're using them course over course throughout their entire program, it's helpful. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and bring in our word cloud that we've been building with some of those. It uh, looks like there's a couple of entries for Padlet. That's why it's getting a little bit larger text than some of our other ones. I did notice earlier that Beth mentioned in the um, chat about our students needing to know that we care for them. Honestly, today, as I was thinking about this um, sort of planning, you know, doing that last minute planning for speaking, one of the words that kept coming into my mind was caring by offering support. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why my students tend to be engaged is because I try to lead with that caring. Again, I'm a nurse, so, um, you know, caring is the foundation of nursing, so that's a big piece. And right now, I think we all need a little grace and caring, given the fact that we continue to be in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I definitely feel like um, I will change some of my practices or can use some of the practices that I have um, 
begun because we are in a pandemic, um, they definitely, it softened me a little bit. This is great. I like, I like being mm -hmm. able to send us away from uh, a, a presentation or a discussion like this with, with uh, hopefully some, some new ideas and this, this word cloud, I would encourage you to continue to build this. If you're trying to think of something you used or, or something comes to mind, this is going to stay active. So please do feel free to enter it. Uh, is there anyone that wants to uh, volunteer to unmute themselves, pick out a tool that you put into the word cloud and just uh, give us a, a brief success story as to how you use it and what the, the student feedback you've gotten from it? This is Beth Renee. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, Beth. Excellent. Uh, so I text students directly using Google Voice and uh, they really um, are much more likely to respond than to anything else. And in the comments, they'll, they'll really appreciate that outreach. And I, like Martha said, I always start out with, you know, are you okay? You know, can we chat? You know, how can I help? Excellent. And I like that you've you actually, mentioned that you use Google Voice for texting too, because that's one thing that we, you know, we don't necessarily encourage faculty to give out their personal phones. And that's one thing that um, faculty are really hesitant to do and understandably so. Um, but that's awesome that you're able to use Google Voice um, to, to do that texting and to open up that means of communication. And, and it can be on my computer and on my phone. So, you know, I can use it wherever I'm at and it helps me track like, okay, what other communications have we had? And, oh, that's right. This is the student whose mother just, you know, et cetera. And it is really helpful that way. We actually have the ability to do that through our phone system on campus. And I do employ that sometimes. It's, it's helpful if, you know, the student hasn't responded to an email to kind of shoot them a text. And, and sometimes I do get a response to that. Yeah, if you- um, Elizabeth if has her hand up. No, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I was just going to add one thing. Uh, if you do use a VOIP service on your campus, a voiceover um, IP, we use Dialpad. Um, a lot of people use it primarily for phone and aren't aware that it can. It's also capable of sending text messages. So if you collect uh, phone numbers from your students, you can text them directly from um, most, if not all, v, uh, VOIP. Um, services like Dialpad and Zoom Voice and things like that. So it was Elizabeth that had her hand up. Yes. So I'm, I'm not positive this counts as a tool, but we sort of think it does. We instituted right after COVID hit, we instituted virtual office hours every week. So every Monday at three o'clock um, for one cohort, we have office hours at four o'clock, a different one every Tuesday. We have office hours five times a week. And we're doing it via Zoom. So the, all the faculty sign in to a Zoom meeting uh, on that day at that time. We tell them we'll stay on for 20 minutes or as long as they need. So we stay till 320. If nobody's there, they don't have questions, we go. And if not, and at the beginning, I think when everybody was hungry for any kind of engagement, at the very, very beginning of after COVID hit, they would come and we would say, okay, what's your question? What can we help you with? Oh, nothing. We just wanted to hang out. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I think that's, I definitely think that's an engagement strategy. Um, I tend to be a little bit more flexible with my office hours, but I, you know, something that's scheduled for a traditional student. Um, I think that's great. Yeah. I think virtual office hours is one of those things that uh, is here to stay even, you know, beyond the pan the pandemic and things like that. Uh, I know clicking a link can often be much less intimidating than walking into um, you know, whether it's a department office or a, or a faculty member's office and things like that. So I think virtual office hours, I know personally as well, like virtual parent teacher conferences, I hope those things are here to stay um, uh, beneficial to all parties, I think. Yeah. John mentioned MS Teams um, is best for showing video film projects. It doesn't freeze as often as others. Um, and Elizabeth, I agree, we're, we're more... Um, I'm more flexible because my students are adults, so I need to meet with them when they need to meet with me. Um, Stacy has her hand up. 
Stacy, do you want to? I don't know how many of you guys. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you guys uh, use Moodle, which actually ours is Open LMS now instead of Moodle, but we have something called the PLD rule, which is the personalized learning designer, and we can set it for different parameters. So like if you give a quiz and someone's score, um, it drops their average below a certain score, or um, I, I like to use mine for people who get a higher score even, and it will send uh, a personalized email to them with kudos in it or something and it looks like it came from me but it's Ooh. it's um less time you know um to do but it really gives them some encouragement I had a student the other day email me and say thank you you know for noticing every time and I I make the rules different each time so it does look like I'm sending you know each one every time their grade gets at a certain point and and I think that gives them some encouragement. And I also do it when their score drops below a certain point. And I remind them of my availability and how much I would love to help them and what our tutoring is and that kind of thing. That's an, that's an excellent uh, point that you made in that, you know, reaching out to not just those that aren't attending class or dropping below that certain threshold, but also those that are excelling and those that are hitting, you know, certain mastery levels or exceeding expectations. Uh, you mentioned PLD and Moodle. Uh, Blackboard Original has a tool called the Retention Center that can do this, that, that can do very similar. It can identify and create mailing lists based on students that are achieving above a certain threshold as well. So, um, you know, those tools are excellent. And, and it sounds like uh, you're, you're leveraging the tool to automate that email, but you're doing a nice job of editing it throughout so it doesn't feel like they're getting a form message every time. So that's uh, kudos to you as well, Stacy. Well, thank you. Because <laughs> they'll, they'll what... catch on quick that it's, a, <laughs> it's an automated message that they're receiving. I'm wondering what Nearpod is. I don't know who added Nearpod and if they would want to share with us. I have not heard of that one or Yellow Dig is another one that I haven't heard of. Well, I know I certainly have a list of new toys to, yeah. to investigate. Can we go back a slide? Of course. Just for a second. Sorry. So I just wanted to talk. This is something that I just started using and I know everyone is familiar with um, Google Slides, but um, I wanted to personalize myself a little bit. So I've set up a um, office that I use as my um, introduction to the students. Sometimes I put it front and center in the course so that they start there. Sometimes I put it in the actual um, introduction discussion, but it gives them a little, I feel like it gives a little bit, of a little picture into me. So, you know, my office really isn't very fancy. Um, you know, I like inspirational sayings. I actually have them all over my office. Um, I have a cat that I talk about all the time and I'm always wearing my uh, Chuck Taylors. So, you know, there's little things about me in here and, um, and David's saying he has a picture of his desk that he shares. Um, and then they just click on that and they actual, they actually get my um, in, in um, video introduction. Um, but I felt like this was a nice kind of gateway into getting to know who I am. Um, and, and, you know, it's not very fancy, but it's a little something to add to the course, to add a little information about me. And again, that's my Bitmoji. So that's how I incorporate it. And I think someone added to the chat um, that Yellow Dig is an LTI enabled discussion formal and Nearpod is a like Mentimeter, but slightly different. And my desk is not organized all the time either. There are so many student response systems out there, Mentimeter, Kahoot, Socrative. Um, uh, it sounds like Nearpod. Uh, there are so many of them out there that have different functionality, Poll Everywhere, 
Um, I, I mean, it, as I talk, I'll probably more will continue to pop into my head. It's really, um, you know, I like looking at all of them because they all t in, take in the information a little differently and you can either share or recall the reports differently. So it's just, it's nice to be able to take a look at those different options. Uh, a couple of things, uh, Martha, if I may, I, I love mm -hmm. this, this virtual classroom because there's a few things that are very specific and very um uh, on point about it. One, the Damon College logo, uh, particularly in online uh, learning, it's it's very common for people to not feel associated with the campus if they're a, a completely remote student. So putting in logos and things like that. I love that you put the screenshot of your actual course in Blackboard on the computer <laughs> on the desktop because it lets it confirms with the students that they're in the right place, that this is about them. And you've also included that where do I begin go to the start here tab on the left hand menu like again it's it, it's reiterating it reinforcing that you know where do i start you are in the right place and, and you're off to a good start so um again i say kudos to the because it, it, it does a couple of really nice things and um uh, uh i'm not sure that uh um uh, i'm not sure how intentional some of those things were but i i recognize them and i appreciate them some of them were and some of them weren't. Um, in the chat, uh, Sue asked um, if anyone had tried using Prezi instead of a discussion forum. I haven't done that. I've only used Prezi for presentations, but I don't know if mm. anyone else has information. I have not used them for discussion forums. I have used Google Slides, Google, mm -hmm. you know, any, any type of multi-author um, tool like Google Slides, Google Drive. Um, Microsoft 360. Um, I've used those for in place of discussion forms. Prezi, uh, I haven't used Prezi in a little while because I know a few years ago it was not necessarily an accessible tool, but then again, a lot of different tools have come a long way in that time. So I don't want to give them a bad, a bad review and not completely know, um, you know, entirely what I'm talking about. We've got about one minute left in the session, one and a half minutes. So if there's any final questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and the next activity up on the conference schedule is the networking break in Gatherly. So um, I don't know if Martha and Peter are able to um, be in Gatherly, but uh, if they are, you can certainly connect with them there. Um, or if you have any uh, contact information that you'd like to share, Martha and Peter, please feel free to do so. Any final words and, and anything else that you'd like to say, I'll go ahead and stop the recording once we're all done. I just appreciate everyone's time and attention. This actually was a great discussion in addition to being able to share some information with you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for for participating, uh, for actively participating, sharing your ideas. And if there's if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Martha. I believe this slide. Yes, I see people, all the anonymous different animals atop of the um, the Google slide. So you're also welcome to. I can also switch it to to commenting. So if you have any questions, you can also drop them right in that Google slide deck um, as well. Thank you both. I wrote down several uh, takeaways for myself as well. So thank you so much. Thank you.